Howdy, it's an Anthropic Science looking at the uses of microorganisms. So the science understandings we're going to go through, we're going to talk about why microorganisms are important to humans, um, using their roles in the digestive system, phytoplankton, recycling as decomposers, and recombinant DNA technology. We're also going to talk about how humans have been using microorganisms for quite a while. So humans have been using microorganisms for a very long time. We have evidence going back about 10,000 years um, for the specific task of uh, people baking and also for people making beer. That goes back about 10,000 years, and both of those uh, jobs um, use brewer's yeast, which is called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Saccharo means sugar, myces means fungus, cerevisiae means beer maker, or beerish. Brewer's yeast has been used to make bread, and also crumpets of course, but beer, wine, vinegar as well, and this has happened for a very long time. What the yeast does is it anaerobically respires. It takes in the sugar from, say, uh, the starch source in the beer, so it hops and wheat, or the wheat in bread, it takes in the sugar and converts that anaerobically to carbon dioxide and ethanol, which is the alcohol in there. So here's the equation for that. So the glucose gets turned into ethanol and carbon dioxide. And like I said, this has been used actively by humans for about 10,000 years. Uh, we use microorganisms and other food products. Um, we use lactic acid bacteria, such as lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, to make fermented uh, milk products like buttermilk, uh, sour cream, cheese, and yogurt. So with those, you have milk, you add a culture of bacteria to the milk, you give it some time at a certain temperature, and the lactic acid bacteria produce lactic acid, which changes the structure of the proteins in the milk, um, and you get your food product out of that. Penicillium fungus is added to blue cheese, so here's some blue cheese, that blue stuff in there, it gives a sharp flavour, um, that's because of the fungus that's added to the cheese. Um, to make soy sauce, you take soybeans and wheat paste, you mix them together and ferment them, you add some bacteria and fungi and then you mash it all up and then strain it and that's how you get your soy sauce. So here's a picture showing how soy sauce is made. So all of these food products are made using microorganisms. Your digestive system contains large amounts of bacteria um, as well. There are more bacteria in your um, intestines than there are people on earth. The job of the bacteria in your intestines, they do several jobs and it depends on the bacteria um, as to what job they do. Some bacteria break down polysaccharides that we can't without, with our enzymes. So uh, large um, polysaccharides that we don't produce enzymes to break down, some bacteria can do. Some bacteria make enzymes for us to do other tasks in our gut. So again, breaking down things normally. And also synthesizing vitamin K. We don't synthesize vitamin K particularly well as humans. So we have bacteria in our gut that can do that for us. And then we absorb that vitamin K into our body and that helps keep us healthy. Phytoplankton are ridiculously important to life on Earth. Um, they're producing most of the oxygen that you're breathing right now. Um, phytoplankton floating around in the Pacific Ocean produce uh, about 70% of all the oxygen you breathe, depending on who you talk to. Um, phytoplankton, they're photoautotrophs. They're very small microorganisms that can photosynthesize. So they take in carbon dioxide that is dissolved in the water, water from the water, uh, light that's shining on the water, and they use that to do photosynthesis. So they turn the carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. So they're producing sugar, and sugar is handy for making lots of structures, and it also makes them quite tasty to other organisms. So they're at the basis of most of the aquatic food chain. So let's have a look at that now. So here's an example of an aquatic food chain. We've got phytoplankton here. The phytoplankton are either sedimenting down to the bottom of the ocean, where they get eaten by detritivores, uh, like lobsters, or they're being eaten by zooplankton. So here's zooplankton here. Zooplankton, uh, an so zoo means animals, so animal plankton. They are um, consuming the phytoplankton to get their energy. Now those zooplankton in turn are eaten by fish, that fish is eaten by the seal, and the seals are eaten by the polar bears. So we can see the basis of this food chain in every direction is the phytoplankton at the start. So they're very important. Microorganisms are also very important for recycling nutrients in the environment. Um, they are very good, depending on the species, at breaking down dead organisms and recycling those nutrients so that they can be used by other organisms. So common decomposers of bacteria and fungi. Um, when you die, the bacteria inside your body will start to consume you from the inside out and break you down so that your nutrients can be used by other organisms. 
Um, fungi are also important. If you walk past a tree in a forest and you see the um, fungi coming out of the side of a tree, that means that tree is in particularly good health because the fungus is breaking down the uh, compounds in that tree and using it. The way they do that is they secrete digestive enzymes outside of the um, organism, so outside of the bacteria or the fungi, and then the enzymes dissolve and break down the um, substances outside and then they absorb those and they digest those and use that to make their own structures. Um, they're very important in food webs, so let's look at some decomposers in food webs. So here's a terrestrial food web, so we've got plants at the bottom, they're being eaten by animals, um, those animals are being eaten by animals, and those animals are being eaten by animals as well. So in this food chain, we can see what's happening up here, but the important thing is at all levels, decomposers are working as well. So as soon as any of these organisms die, or the remains are left out in the environment, they start to get broken down by bacteria and fungi, and those bacteria and fungi, and earthworms are also uh, part of the decomposing cycle, they release the nutrients from the organic uh, remains of the living things, and that goes back into the soil. So that increases the quality of the soil, allows more plants to grow, more plants to grow means more animals, and the cycle continues. So at every level of the food web, you have decomposers acting. The last example I'm going to use of humans using microorganisms is recombinant DNA technology. Now this is a little bit complex, but it's very interesting and it's kind of important. What recombinant DNA technology allows you to do is to take genes from one species and put it into bacteria. And that bacteria can reproduce really, really quickly. So you can produce um, lots of copies of a gene, or you can produce gene products, um, so proteins, for example. The way this works is that bacteria cells can contain these rings of DNA called plasmids. These plasmids are handy because they allow bacteria to exchange information from one bacterium to another. Uh, the way they do this is they grow a pillus between one bacteria and the other, they send a copy of the plasmid through, and then the um, pili break off from each other. So this is a way to, for bacteria to exchange information um, without having sexual reproduction. What's interesting about this is one bacterial species can donate to a completely different bacterial species. Um, that's the equivalent of me going up and poking a flower and then suddenly being able to do photosynthesis. Why this is handy is because you can produce large amounts of um, a protein that maybe someone isn't producing naturally. So insulin is the example that we're going to look at, and let's have a look at how that works. So before recombinant DNA technology came around, it was very expensive to produce insulin. You would extract small amounts from cattle, and you'd use that bovine insulin to try and treat people. But you'd only get a small amount per um, cow, and uh, it's a different type of, it's slightly different type of insulin to humans. So what they do, what they did is they took the gene from a human cell for um, insulin production. They cut that using a restriction enzyme, which is, we call it molecular scissors. They cut DNA at particular sequences. They use that same restriction enzyme on a plasmid from a bacterium. So they use the same scissors to cut. Then they mixed the DNA from the human with the DNA ring, the plasmid ring from the bacteria and they stuck together, and then you insert that plasmid back into a bacterium using a variety of techniques. So now you have a human gene inside a bacterial plasmid, and then that's inside a bacterium. The handy thing about putting the DNA in a human bacterium is bacteria reproduce really, really quickly. So you put this bacteria into one of these fermentation chambers over here, you provide it with the nutrients it needs to reproduce in a nice temperature, and you stir it up a little bit, and you can produce many, many copies of the uh, bacterium. Now, because this gene here produces human insulin, the bacteria will start to produce human insulin as well. So you get a lot of insulin being produced in these um, chambers, and then you can just extract that from the fluid in the chambers and use that in humans. So this technique can be used both to produce gene products like insulin, so proteins like insulin that people not, might not be producing themselves, but also you can get lots and lots of copies of human genes that you can then extract and put into other organisms as well. So it's a very handy technique. So today on Flipping Science, we looked at um, how humans use microorganisms to make our lives better. That's it for Flipping Science today. See ya.